We speak now to Ms. Lebohang Pego, who is an activist scholar, public intellectual and development practitioner. She joins us now to shed some light on the significance of the EU-Africa summit and some of the things that would be expected from it. A very good evening to you, Ms. Pego, and thank you so much for speaking to us. Uh, we've heard what President Ramaphosa says uh, he sees as the importance of it. But the meeting will see leaders from both continents gather to discuss their partnership, trade, investments, education and agriculture, as he mentioned. But that's almost two years after contending with the hardships of COVID-19 and rising nationalism that we saw as a result. How then is this relationship to be characterized as it lifts off again? Thank you, Sabiso. So basically, the, this is the sixth summit, as you rightly say, um, and it also comes at a time when there's some disquiet around the way that the EU and AU summit has been handled or has been configured previously. And there are a few countries significantly, Nigeria, Kenya, and of course, South Africa, who may or may not be in attendance and who have said that really that the summit's credibility itself needs to be, is going to be put into question because, um, you know, there th seems as though there the, the is an attempt to really re-inscript some very problematic relationships, um, particularly in the context of vaccine hoarding and especially in the context of really unresolved geopolitical controversies, um, particularly at the moment on the African continent. There are four countries, uh, at least four or five countries, which not, won't be in, in attendance because Usually when a government has been, um, you know, has been dis displaced or has been installed through coup d'etat, they are then banned from this summit. So we have, um, I think, four or five countries at the moment mm. which are not going to be present. So it really is comes at a time when on the continent we're dealing with very important, um, timely governance issues whilst also trying to figure out how we want to relate to Europe um, as a bloc and as an idea going forward. Mm. And, and, and just as you were rounding up some of those salient points, I mean, when you talk about security in Africa, particularly in the Sahel region, uh, fingers uh, are pointed in the direction of uh, former colonizers uh, who mm. are seen to continuing to be meddling on the continent and exacerbating the insecurity. You talk about vaccine development. Uh, uh, there has been uh, a plea from South Africa and India and other African countries for mm -hmm. a waiver on intellectual property. Can we talk about a relationship of trust? Yeah, I think, I think with anything that has been has its historical formation in um, sort of a colonial and uh, quite a you know a, a, and a colonial inscript and something that you know a, a relationship which of course has been quite violent um it you know it comes as a result of really trying to almost rehabilitate very uncomfortable histories um and very uncomfortable and, and, and trying to mediate how those uncomfortable violate and sometimes very toxic histories sit in the present day uh, and i think i mean uh, certainly i think that those those that will always be a challenge with these sorts of formations, um, it, we will we won't be able to forget about um, you know the, the the Berlin Conference and all of these. And I think that, that the irony is that European countries are often the ones which are um, quite quite connected with current day disquiet on the continent. Um, but also that in, in, there's this, there's quite a, a historical way of discussing present-day challenges of the African continent. I think that sometimes it does feel extremely infantilizing and very problematic. It often as well, the trade relations are often quite problematic because they then rely on particular monopolies, historical colonial monopolies, where um, certainly former, former colonizing powers often behave as though they have a right to um, particular country economies. And I think that France and its very, uh, very paternalistic um, relationship with uh, some of the French, or well, nearly all of the French-speaking countries, is the most is, is the most glaring example of that. But I mean, I mean, the UK, um, you know, Italy to a lesser extent, Portugal, I um, mean, you know, none of these, Spain, none of these countries should, should certainly absolve themselves. I mean, the UK in particular. Um, I think, you know, certainly when we look at what is called the Commonwealth um, and how that wealth is really hardly distributed again throughout the, 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 the country 
concerned, um, you know, I think that we have to be very cautious and very clear that this is these are these are these are attempts often to rehabilitate toxic colonial relationships. Mm. So Europe has said it's earmarked some 150 billion euros for investment mm -hmm. in Africa to help with mm -hmm. the green and digital transition, job creation, mm -hmm. health and education. And, and mm -hmm. not to chip at the talks before they begin, but there are those who'd argue that if you look at the financial outflows coming out of Africa and how it's robbed it from, you know, created its own systems, there is the billions of US dollars and euros that Africa has been cheated out of through corruptions, etc., etc. I, I guess what I'm asking is, is this money that is rightfully coming back to Africa or is it still going to have the kind of conditions that will debilitate uh, Africa? Mm. So, as we are aware, the vast majority of... Um, the money that leaves the continent is through illicit financial flows, and then, of course, more, country, more, more money leaves the continent than that which is um, supposedly invested or that arrives from the global north in aid um, in loans and so forth. And uh, the, the nature of the relationship between the European Union and the African continent is an is in permanent evolution um, to be so. So I think historically the EU dominated the relationship while African countries basically had to use adaptive, very reactive strategies. Um, and I think the, the, the establishment of these sort of certainly much more robust um, senses of, of sovereignty and new powers as well as offers to, to you know, the effort to decolonize the thought and practice of northern southern um, interactions have certainly changed or are changing what the future of that relationship could be. Yeah, um, and I suppose certainly the the from a historical perspective, this evolution has been quite well documented. But I mean, it's it's been one where um, the African continent has had to be quite pragmatic um, and survivalist in its um, posture within this relationship. And I think taking into account the transformation of, of the current transformation of global orders um, and the establishment of different powers as well, um, it is important to rethink what the debates on um, broadening EU-Africa relationships could be. And I think that there's some people within the continent who would argue that, that certainly this relationship is not one that benefits the African continent per se. It is one of survival. It is one of pragmatism on the, on the part of many African countries. And at best, perhaps, as you say, one, an attempt to extract some form of um, dividend, um, financial or aid dividend from this relationship. Um, I don't think that what we're going to receive is ever going to be some form. But, you know, I think what, 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 what some people... Um, would like to see would be almost some kind of a reparation, some kind of a restitutive mm. type of um, um, type of um, funding and, and, and sorts of arrangements landing on the continent. But I, I'm not sure whether the EU Africa Forum has the kind of quite progressive, um, dare I say, radical um, architecture to even host that kind of conversation. It's such a pleasure. We have run out of time, but thank you so much uh, for speaking to us, sharing your insights. Ms. Lebohang Diebol Lopego, an activist, scholar, public intellectual, and development practitioner.